For centuries, the Arctic's northern sea route has promised a shortcut so powerful it could reshape global trade. Yet for generations, ships vanished into its crushing ice, their journeys stretching over a year across a passage 40% shorter than the Suez. In 2025, nuclear icebreakers power through what once ended expeditions, splitting ridges thicker than steel and keeping convoys moving where nature never allowed. But how do these engineered leviathans really work? And at what cost does this Arctic mega route stay open when the stakes are nothing less than control of an emerging ocean? The answer begins with the pioneers who risked everything for a route few believed could ever exist. From the Barents Sea in the west to the Bering Strait in the east, the northern sea route traces a jagged line across the top of the world, a corridor carved through the Arctic, hugging the Siberian coast for nearly 3,000 nautical miles. For centuries, this frozen passage has tempted navigators and nations alike with a simple calculation. Distance. The numbers are stark. A voyage from Rotterdam to Yokohama, routed through the Suez Canal, stretches more than 14,000 nautical miles. Along the northern sea route, that same journey shrinks to about 8,600 nautical miles, nearly 40% less. Every mile saved means less fuel burn, less time at sea and fewer costs for shipping companies. On paper, the Arctic shortcut looks irresistible. Maps tell their own story. The classic trade arteries, Suez, Panama, arc across warm, well-traveled waters, but the northern sea route slices across the very edge of the inhabitable world. The route's geography is both its promise and its peril. It runs entirely within Russia's exclusive economic zone, skirting the desolate coasts of the Kara, Laptov, and East Siberian seas, past islands that for most of the year remain locked in ice. Yet the prize is unmistakable, a direct link between Europe and Asia, bypassing the long detour through the Indian Ocean and Red Sea. For shipping giants, the prospect of cutting weeks off a round trip is more than a curiosity. It's a potential revolution. The lure of the shortcut has never been just about economics. In the age of sail, the passage was a blank spot on the map place of rumor and myth. By the late 19th century, explorers and traders measured its promise in lives lost and fortunes spent. Each new expedition returned with tales of ice-bound ships, months-long delays, and desperate winterings on barren shores. Yet the idea refused to die. The harshness of the route only deepened its allure. For Russia, the northern sea route offered not just a commercial advantage, but a national artery a pathway to the oil, gas, and mineral riches buried beneath the Arctic shelf, and a strategic corridor no rival could control. The numbers alone drove ambition. A 40% reduction in distance between Europe and Asia would reshape global shipping, redraw the map of energy exports, and challenge the supremacy of older trade routes. Every new generation of planners and engineers returned to the same question. Could the Arctic shortcut finally be mastered? The answer would depend not on maps or dreams, but on the ability to conquer what lay across those 8,600 nautical miles. An ocean of moving ice, shifting channels, and winter darkness. The temptation was always there. The challenge, as history would show, was something else entirely. In August 1914, two Russian icebreakers, Tymir and Vygok, set out from Arkhangelsk, carrying hydrographers and crew who understood that survival would depend on steel, discipline, and luck. Their goal was audacious, to complete the first full transit of the northern sea route, from the White Sea to the Bering Strait, through a labyrinth of uncharted ice. By the time the first snows fell, the ships had already collided with the Arctic's reality. Pressure ridges, some rising over four meters above the flows, blocked the way at every turn. The hulls groaned under the strain. Crewmen recorded in their logs how progress was measured not in miles, but in hours spent waiting for tides, or in the number of charges set to blast a channel through the ice. At times, the only movement came from the wind howling across the deck, driving snow sideways, erasing the horizon and any hope of clear passage. Winter descended with little warning. Both vessels became beset near the Timer Peninsula, locked in a vice of ice so dense that the engines could do nothing but idle. For months, the crews endured polar night and temperatures plunging below minus 40. The log of Tamer's captain from January 1915 describes pressure ridges towering above the deck 
the ship's steel skin battered daily by ice that refused to yield. Repairs were constant, rivets hammered back into place, hull seams checked for leaks, propeller blades inspected for cracks. The ice was not just an obstacle, it was a living, grinding force, threatening to crush the expedition at any moment. Supplies dwindled, morale fluctuated with the weather, and the slow return of daylight. In the spring, the men dynamited their way free, only to encounter new barriers, endless fields of broken ice, shifting channels, and the ever-present threat of being trapped again. One hydrographer aboard Vygotch wrote, Our spirits are buoyed by the thought that this long white ordeal will soon end, but the ice shows no mercy. We mark each day with hope, and with new scars to the ship. After more than a year in late September 1915, the battered icebreakers finally reached the Bering Strait. The voyage had lasted over 12 months, with multiple forced winterings and every mile hard won. Yet the achievement was undeniable. For the first time, a documented east to west passage of the northern sea route had been completed. Along the way, the expedition mapped the last unknown archipelago of the Russian Arctic, Severnaya Zemlya, proving that the route was navigable, but only at the cost of relentless struggle. Their ordeal exposed the limits of early 20th century engineering. Steel hulls bent, engines faltered, and human endurance was stretched to the breaking point. The lesson was clear. If the northern sea route was ever to become a true artery of commerce, something far stronger would be needed. Vessels with the power to master not just open water, but the unyielding ice itself. Raw power is the language of the Arctic, and the nuclear icebreakers speak it fluently. Each vessel is built around a hull that can shrug off what would cripple an ordinary ship. Along the waterline, the so-called ice belt, plating up to 50 millimeters thick, wraps the ship in armor, forged from high toughness steel that keeps its strength even at minus 40 degrees Celsius. The bow is no ordinary prow, it's a spoon-shaped wedge, designed to ride up onto the ice, focusing thousands of tons of force downward to fracture the flows beneath. Every meter advanced is a contest between engineered metal and the crushing, grinding pressure of the pack. But muscle alone is not enough. Deep within the hull, twin nuclear reactors, RITM-200 on the Arctica class, and soon the RITM-400 for the leader project, generate a continuous 60 megawatts or more, day after day, week after week. That's enough to power a city of 100,000 delivered straight to four giant electric motors. The result, propellers that can chew through ice three meters thick and keep going for months without refueling. These ships are not limited by fuel bunkers or supply lines. Their endurance is measured in years, not days. Every component is built for punishment. Frames and bulkheads are spaced close, bracing the hull for repeated shocks. Special polymers and abrasion-resistant coatings shield the steel from scouring ice. Even the propeller blades, massive, skewed, and sometimes clad in stainless steel, are designed to survive direct impacts with blocks of frozen sea. Sensors embedded along the hull monitor strain and flex, feeding data to the bridge so crew can track the ship's health in real time. In the Arctic, failure is not an option. The icebreaker's strength, measured in millimeters of steel, megawatts of power, and the relentless drive of nuclear engines, is what turns the promise of the northern sea route into a working reality. Convoy navigation in the Arctic is a study in precision and nerve. Each vessel follows the icebreaker at a prescribed distance, never less than 150 meters, often more, close enough to avoid the channel freezing over, far enough to prevent a collision if the lead ship halts abruptly. In winter, the formation moves as a single organism, guided not by sunlight but by radar, satellite charts, and the practiced eye of the ice pilot. The bridge is quiet, except for the hum of electronics and the clipped exchanges over the radio. Every maneuver is deliberate, on the icebreaker's command, the convoy holds speed at eight knots. Too fast, and a trailing ship could strike a ridge or lose the track. Too slow, and the channel begins to close behind, trapping the rear vessel in a vice of shifting brash ice. Night in the high Arctic is not a gentle darkness, but an unbroken expanse, pierced only by the glow of navigation lights and the faint pulse of the aurora. The outside temperature plunges to minus 30 degrees Celsius, and every exposed surface ices over in minutes, 
Crew members rotate through shifts, faces wrapped in layers, checking deck machinery and clearing frost from sensors. Inside, the ice pilot studies the next segment of the route. Satellite images update in real time, revealing pressure ridges and open leads invisible to the naked eye. The convoy's path is adjusted by degrees, sometimes only a few hundred meters, to avoid a field of multi-year flows. If a merchant ship becomes stuck, the routine shifts instantly. The icebreaker halts, reverses course, and powers its propellers astern. A churning wash clears the brash ice, freeing the stranded vessel. All ships maintain their spacing, engines idling as the channel is restored. The doctrine is strict, no improvisation, no deviation from protocol. In these conditions, discipline is survival. The Arctic offers no margin for error. When a cargo ship becomes trapped in multi-year ice, the clock starts ticking. Every hour spent immobile risks, hull damage, fuel loss, and most dangerous of all, crew exposure to the Arctic's relentless cold. The rescue protocol is as precise as it is unforgiving. On the bridge, the icebreaker's rescue leader issues a single command. Engines astern, prepare for extraction. The convoy halts at a safe distance, engines idling, while the icebreaker reverses course. Propellers spin up, churning a violent wash that scours the brash ice away from the stranded vessel's hull. If the channel remains blocked, the next step is clear. Deploy the towline teams. Deckhands bundled in layers against the minus 30 wind haul heavy synthetic lines across the ice. The operation is timed to the second. Any slip, any snag, and the line can snap with lethal force. Helicopter support stands by overhead, ready to drop a messenger line if the ice is too thick or the gap too wide for a direct handoff. On the bridge, the rescue leader coordinates every move by radio, counting off meters and adjusting tension as the icebreaker slowly applies power. The goal is not brute force, but finesse. Enough pull to free the ship without tearing out the bollards or damaging the propeller. Sometimes the extraction takes minutes, other times, hours pass as the icebreaker alternates between backing, washing, and towing, each maneuver designed to exploit the smallest weakness in the ice. Throughout, the stranded crew watches the hull sensors for signs of strain, ready to sound the alarm at the first hint of a breach. In rare cases, even the nuclear-powered muscle of the lead ship is not enough. The rescue logs from the 2019 Nordic Mistral incident describe a freighter so deeply embedded that only coordinated tow lines, bubbler systems, and helicopter relays could break the grip. The lesson is written in every extraction. There are limits to even the most advanced icebreakers. Each rescue is a reminder that the Arctic sets the rules, and that future ships will need to be stronger still. 70,000 tons of displacement twice the heft of any previous icebreaker, form the backbone of the leader class. The hull stretches over 650 feet, its beam nearly 150 feet across, designed not just for brute strength, but for creating a channel wide enough to shepherd the largest LNG carriers through the heart of the Arctic. Power is the watchword. Two RITM-400 nuclear reactors, each rated at 315 megawatts, deliver a combined output of 120 megawatts to the propeller shafts. That's enough electricity to light up a city, but here, it is channeled into four colossal electric motors, each turning a propeller the size of a small house. For the first time, designers at the Iceberg Bureau paired this scale with a dual draft system, allowing the vessel to adjust its draft for deep or shallow waters, an essential adaptation for the shifting depths along the northern sea route. Every dimension, every watt, is engineered to break through four meters of solid ice at a steady two knots, making year-round passage not just possible but routine. The secret to the icebreaker's dominance lies in a choreography of systems, each designed to turn raw reactor power into unstoppable forward motion. Up front, the spoon-shaped bow does more than just ride up on the ice. It focuses the ship's mass downward, shattering sheets several meters thick. But even steel has its limits against the Arctic's grip. That's where the air lubrication network comes into play. Dozens of nozzles along the hull pump compressed air beneath the waterline, creating a stream of bubbles that slip between steel and ice. The result is a dramatic reduction in friction, up to 30% less resistance, according to naval architects at the Iceberg Bureau. When the ship is wedged tight, healing tanks shift thousands of tons of ballast from side to side, rocking the vessel free with a controlled sway. 
Deep inside, the journey from uranium to propeller is a continuous flow. Nuclear reactors heat water into steam, turbines convert that heat into electricity, and four massive motors channel the current to the propeller shafts. Each component acts in concert, bow, bubbles, ballast, and the relentless pulse of electricity, turning the physics of icebreaking into a daily reality along the northern sea route. Proof of the leader's promise comes not just from blueprints, but from the controlled violence of ice tank trials at the Krylov State Research Center. Here, scale models face down slabs of artificial ice, each run pushing the design to its limits. In one standout test, the leader's hull shattered a four-meter barrier at a steady two knots, a feat confirmed by precise instrumentation and overseen by engineers who have spent lifetimes measuring the difference between theory and survival. The numbers are not just for show. Convoy captains and shipping companies rely on them to plan routes, calculate margins, and trust that the ship will deliver, even when the Arctic closes in. Yet for all its brute force, the leader's nuclear heart remains sealed and silent. Each reactor core is locked within layers of steel and concrete, its fuel untouched by the crew, its waste never exposed to the sea. When the time comes, spent fuel is removed only at Murmansk's Atomflot base, transferred under strict protocols to secure storage and eventual reprocessing at Mayak. Decades of operation have produced no radiological leaks, no marine contamination, just a record of tight control and regulatory oversight. In the world of nuclear-powered icebreaking, cleanliness is measured not in words, but in the absence of headlines. The myth of the dirty reactor fades against a backdrop of data, discipline, and the quiet confidence of those who build and run these ships. In 1915, it took over a year for the first ships to force their way across the northern sea route. Today, nuclear icebreakers deliver 120 megawatts of power to push through four meter thick ice, guiding convoys with proven protocols and real-time satellite data. Yet, not all operational details and environmental impacts are publicly documented. Some records, particularly around nuclear systems and Arctic rescue missions, remain restricted. What is clear is that climate change has opened the route for longer periods, but multi-year ice still demands the most advanced engineering available. The Project 10510 Leader class represents a leap in both scale and safety, with sealed core reactors and air lubrication systems reducing friction by 30%. As global trade and geopolitical interests converge in the Arctic, the Northern Sea Route stands as both a technical achievement and a continuing test. The exact limits of Arctic navigation and the full consequences for the region are still unfolding.